time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFULP Urbana, 104.5 FM. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza, and I am here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU or UCIMC, or as we like to say on the televised version of this show, UPTV. These views are our own, and by our, in this instance, I mean myself and me. Me, myself, and I, all three of us. But anyway, that's who I mean. So, uh, things going on, the usual stuff, good, bad, and worse. <laughs> Hard to know where to begin. The, the, the first thing, we don't have much information about it. I'll just read this really quickly. It's entitled, Trump Planning Executive Order. President Trump is expected to sign an executive order that will officially forbid undocumented immigrants from being included in the 2020 United States Census. It is unclear when the order will officially come down, according to Reuters, which first reported the news. The decennial, the decennial count of the U.S. population plays an enormous role in determining how federal money is spent and in deciding the allocation of representation in the 50 states. Population shifts between the decades can have significant consequences. New York and Ohio lost two members of the House of Representatives after the 2010 census, while Texas picked up four. The Trump administration has long sought to prevent Mexicans in the U.S. illegally from influencing the official count. An original plan to ask 2020 census respondents their immigration status was thrown out by the Supreme Court. The order, when it comes, will likely face a legal challenge. Um, so far, what little uh, I have been able to determine about this is that this is not really uh, something he can legally do. I mean, he can say, do this, and uh, some people perhaps will go along with it. I don't know, but uh, by and large, it is possible to stop it because he does not have the authority to do that, to to basically rewrite the rules for how the census is done unilaterally. Um, I think this is uh, just sort of another way of trying to get people to be afraid or concerned about filling the census. Um, so far, this administration has seemed to excel primarily at confusing the issue. Like whatever the situation is, whatever uh, problems that exist or um, things that are going on, what they do best is say confusing and contradictory things, uh, make claims that can't be substantiated, and basically get everyone wondering and worrying and unsure of how they're going to deal with the situation as opposed to just knowing what to do and and how to go about doing it. Um, so this is clearly another effort in that long line of, of I'm not even sure what you call it, just uh, throw a bunch of stuff up and see what happens and just get everybody running in different different directions. I think this is another effort along those lines. Um, he may actually think he has the authority to do this. Somebody may have told him that he does. Uh, I don't see how this is even remotely possible that he would uh, because of the way the census is structured and, and uh, how you know it is designed. But we'll see what happens. We'll keep an eye on this and we'll talk about it more uh, later if and when it actually happens and we'll see what the responses are to it. Um, but it's something worth keeping an eye on, uh, which I already said is what we will do, but it's something worth you keeping an eye on. Um, anyway, here's another something worth keeping an eye on that you may want to pay attention to. It is entitled, How the Trump Administration is Turning Legal Immigrants into Undocumented Ones. The Trump administration is turning legal immigrants into undocumented ones. That is, the Show Me Your Papers administration has literally switched off printers needed to generate those papers. Without telling Congress, 
the administration has scaled back the printing of documents it has already promised to immigrants, including green cards, the wallet-sized IDs legal permanent residents must carry everywhere to prove they are in the United States lawfully. In mid-June, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services contract ended with the company that had been printing these documents. Production was slated to be insourced, but the agency's financial situation, USCIS said Thursday, prompted a hiring freeze that required it to ratchet down printing. In an interview that aired July 10th, President Trump said his administration was working out the legal complexities of an executive order on immigration. Some 50,000 green cards and 75,000 other employment authorization documents promised to immigrants haven't been printed, USCIS said in a statement. The agency said it had planned to escalate printing, but that it cannot speculate on future projections of processing times. In the event of furloughs, which the agency has threatened if it does not get $1.2 billion loan from Congress. All agency operations will be affected. Some of the missing greed cards are for immigrants newly approved for legal permanent residency. Others are for existing permanent residents who periodically must renew their identity cards, which expire every 10 years, but sometimes must be replaced sooner, for example, if it's lost. These immigrants have completed every interview, required biometric assessment cleared other hurdles, and often waited years for these critical credentials. The Immigration and Nationality Act requires every adult legal permanent resident to carry their green card at all times. Failing to carry it is a misdemeanor subject to jail time or fines. Immigrants must also show their green cards to apply for jobs, travel, or re-enter the United States. Understandably, panicked immigrants have been inundating, inundating, hard word to say today, USCIS with calls seeking to locate their documents. Our volume of inquiries has spiked concerning cases being approved, but the cards are not being produced, said one agency employee. A lot are expedite requests and we cannot do anything about it. It's costing people jobs and undue stress. This employee added, it really does frustrate a lot of us to not let applicants know what's really going on. Normally, within 48 hours of applicant's approval, USCIS's online system indicates that a card has been printed. Immigration attorneys across the country have been puzzled recently because these status updates never appeared. Many thought the delays were tied to COVID-19, which has caused other service disruptions. One Philadelphia attorney, Anu Nair, said a USCIS officer let slip early in early June that all contractors were about to be laid off and to expect long delays with paperwork. Memphis-based attorney Alyssa Taub inquired about her client's missing green card and got a cryptic email, quote, the system has to be updated so that a card can be produced. You will receive the card in the mail once the system is updated. USCIS, which is funded almost entirely by fees, is undergoing a budget crisis largely caused by financial mismanagement by political leadership. The printing disruptions are no doubt a preview of chaos to come if the agency furloughs about 70% of its workforce, as it has said it will do in a few weeks absent a congressional bailout. In recent conversations with congressional staffers about cutting contracts to save money, USCIS mentioned only one contract for a different division that was being reduced and made no reference to this printing contract, according to a person who took part in those discussions. The company that had this contract, Logistics Systems Incorporated, did not respond to emails and calls this week requesting comment. The administration has taken other steps in recent months that curb immigration. Presidential executive orders have almost entirely ended issuance of green cards and work-based visas for people applying from outside the country. Red tape and bureaucracy have slowed the process for those applying from within U.S. borders. For a while, the agency refused to forward files from one office to another. The centers that collect necessary biometric data remain shuttered. These pipeline delays are likely to dramatically reduce the number of green cards ultimately approved and issued this year. Under normal circumstances, immigrants who need proof of legal residency 
but haven't yet received their green cards would have an alternative. Get a special passport stamp from USCIS. But amid COVID-related changes, applicants must provide evidence of a critical need with little guidance about what that means. The bottom line is that applicants pay huge filing fees and it appears that these fees have apparently been either squandered through mismanagement or diverted to enforcement focused initiatives to the great detriment of applicants as well as the overall efficiency of the immigration process, says Anna Sallet, an immigration attorney in Coral Gables, Florida. The administration has accomplished its goal of shutting down legal immigration without actually changing the law. And here you have again, this uh, follows the first bit and what I was talking about, this is another way of just sowing chaos, creating problems everywhere without actually uh, changing the law, as they say. Um, what the Trump administration has excelled at throughout its time in power, I guess is the way you would put it, is that when they can't do something legally, they find another way to do it. They don't give up. If they're told, no, you legally must do this, they go, okay, and then they just go around or underneath or over. Uh, they find some way to create the same problem or create the change or create something very much like the change that they were seeking to uh, do through the legal process in another way. And because it's not actually changing the law, lawmakers uh, from either party can't do much of anything about it. They can take things to court, and they do regularly, uh, and that just drags it out. And in the meantime, everybody is confused. Nobody knows what's happening. Nobody knows how to fix it and onward we go and this happens over and over and over and over again uh, this is not the right way to run a government even if you agree with the their overall goals what you're agreeing to by supporting them is uh, going around and subverting the rule of law which is the very thing that um, anti-immigrant <laughs> agitators seem to hold so dear. Well, if, if they came here legally, it would be fine, but they don't. Well, if you make it impossible to come here legally, what's left? They can't come, and that's the idea, and that's what's happening here. Um, so it's just on and on and on the same thing. It's bamboozlement, it's uh, misdirection, it's throwing dust in your eyes. It's uh, saying, look over there and, and distracting you. It is doing every possible thing they can do to get their way without following proper channels because they know that if they follow proper channels, it won't work. They will not be allowed to do that. So uh, this is an illegal administration. I mean, it, they are criminals. They are subverting the law and um, to their own ends, and uh, there is not enough pushback on this, and there needs to be more, and it, it doesn't look like there's going to be until the election, and that is why everyone must vote. Absolutely must vote. All right, moving on. Um, more of the same. Colleges win immigration battle, but fear for U.S. reputation. Surprise, surprise. Universe, try that again. University leaders see it as a steady erosion. They say the Trump administration's repeated attempts to curb immigration have sent students a message that they aren't welcome in the United States. You're not welcomed by some people. <laughs> some of us welcome you with open arms, but uh, we're not the ones in charge right now. Anyway, colleges say foreign students are listening. Since President Donald Trump was elected in 2016, the number of new international students coming to the U.S. has fallen by 10% after years of growth. Already there's concern that the coronavirus pandemic and a slowdown of visa processing could prevent thousands of students from returning this fall. Foreign students now face even more uncertainty after seeing how quickly policies can change, 
and on nothing more than a political whim, said Kim Wilcox, Chancellor of the University of California, Riverdale. Higher education in the United States is still seen as the gold standard around the globe, but access to it comes with all kinds of risks, Wilcox said. There's a growing sense that we're just not a welcoming place. Trump's latest policy would have forced international students in the U.S. to transfer or leave the country if their schools held classes entirely online because of the pandemic. Even those at universities offering a mix of online and in-person classes would have been forbidden from taking all their classes online. More than 200 colleges signed legal briefs supporting a federal lawsuit by Harvard University and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Seven other suits followed as colleges and states challenged the guidance. Called to court to defend the guidance, federal officials revoked it instead. Oh, what a surprise. It was widely seen as part of Trump's recent campaign to pressure the nation's schools and colleges to reopen this fall, even as the coronavirus continues to surge. But even in defeat, the policy fed a narrative that American universities are no longer the welcoming places they once were, said Dennis Wirtz, vice provost for research at John Hopkins University. It comes as schools in Canada, Australia, and other nations push to attract more international scholars. Over time, Wirtz said, those countries may win the world's top talent. It's painful for Wirtz, 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 that's a hard name. <laughs> it's painful for Wirtz to see. He came to the U.S. from Belgium in 1988 and recalls how warmly he was welcomed. Now he warns prospective students and researchers that beyond campus borders, there's growing hostility towards immigrants. All those great scholars, wherever they are, India, China, Europe, may now elect to go elsewhere or simply to stay home, he said. We will see it affect four or five years from now. It's not falling off a cliff, but over time you have this creep down the slope toward mediocrity. The concern is shared by leaders at other elite research universities. Only hours after the administration retreated from its policy, MIT's president published an op-ed warning that other countries are working hard to attract students who have soured on the United States because of growing anti-immigrant hostility or bureaucratic roadblocks. Our competitors openly envy our capacity to welcome and adopt talent from everywhere. I fear lately that we will recognize this strategic U.S. strength only once it is lost, El Rafael Reef wrote. That's hard to say. El Rafael Reef wrote. <laughs> I'm having a hard time today with all this. There's also a looming fear that the administration will return with a revised rule as it did after a 2017 travel ban faced legal challenges. Hoping to ease nerves, dozens of colleges have issued statements pledging to support their international students, and many say they're prepared to return to court if needed. Daniel Deermeyer, Chancellor of Vanderbilt University, said it isn't too late to repair the damage. America's higher education system is still viewed as the best in the world, he said, but that could change. We're going to have to fix this very quickly. We're going to have to recommit to the policy that has brought so much benefit to the United States, he said. Talent will go where it sees the best opportunity for itself. U.S. colleges already were bracing for sharp decreases in the number of students coming from abroad. It's still to be seen how many will arrive this fall, but it's expected to be far below the nearly 1.1 million who came last year. The decline could devastate budgets at colleges that rely on tuition from foreign students, who typically pay higher rates. But the impact extends far beyond budgets, Deermeyer said. International students account for a major share of the nation's research force, he said especially in science and engineering fields that attract fewer Americans. They make significant contribution, contributions to the economy, and without them, it would suffer, he said. College leaders called the latest legal battle a significant victory that showed their power when they unite, but they already see other skirmishes on the horizon. The administration has signaled that it wants to limit a program that lets foreign students work up to one year during college or after graduation or up to three years for those in science and technology fields. 
Colleges have also opposed Trump's recent suspension of new H-1B work visas, which many international students use to find work after graduation. Helping lead the fight for universities is the President's Alliance on Higher Education and Immigration, a group of college leaders that formed in 2017 to advocate on immigration issues. It helped orchestrate college's recent legal campaign, and it says it's ready to stand up for international students again. This was not a blip, says Marian Fieldbaum, an organization's executive director. We have to continue to monitor this closely. We have to be prepared to act, and we have to be creative when we act. The defeat of the latest policy was a relief to Aaron Ricardo Perez Lopez of Hungary, who's studying computer science at MIT, but the episode added to a growing feeling of uncertainty about his place here, and it gives him pause as he starts applying to doctorate programs. Until recently, he was confident he wanted to continue his education in the U.S. Now, he isn't so sure. I'm also exploring options abroad now, because you never know what's going to happen, he said. I don't want to be worried about this for another five years. Again, <laughs> again, again, each one of these stories, there's a theme here. So confusion. Push really hard one way and then go back off and then see how people react. And everybody says, oh, I don't know how this is going. I'm not sure what the future holds. I can't rely on these people. And that's exactly what they want you to feel. They want you to feel like you have no control. It is, sorry, uh, I keep repeating myself on a lot of this stuff, but this is the same thing that's happening over and over again, and that's the story here. That has been the story all along, is that it, let's sow confusion, let's make everyone feel powerless and make us stronger because we're the ones who can push things in the way we want them to go. So they can't do everything they want to do, but what they can do is keep pushing in the direction that they want to push and keep pulling the rug out under your feet so that you can't push back, so you can't coordinate, so you don't know exactly what's happening. So what is the new rule now? What is the situation now? What is the law now? Because none of that even matters. The rule of law does not even matter anymore if they find ways around it, like our story about the green cards being printed. If being documented doesn't actually mean anything unless you have a piece of paper, which you can't get, then it means nothing. And um, this is serious stuff. I, I, I don't know how to impress this upon people, how seriously off the rails we have become in this country over this last four years. Uh, three years and a half, I guess, is what it is now. I mean, we are way off the track, and we're headed for big crashes everywhere. We're right now in the middle of a slow-motion crash on the uh, COVID pandemic, which you can watch, and you can see the numbers rise in real time as the complete lack of coordination, lack of response, lack of consistent messaging has created a situation where everybody goes, I'm not sure what's going on, so I'll just try and deal with my own little spot right here. I'm just trying to get some control over this little area that I'm in because that's the only thing I have control over. And um, you can see how well that's working. Uh, California, Texas, Florida, Arizona, their numbers is shooting through the roof and um, no end in sight to this. And this, once again, is due to this administration and the way they do things. They don't want to deal with this. They don't want to have to deal with this. They want everything to be sunny and bright and everybody making lots of money, or so they seem, uh, or so they imagine, and uh, so that they'll just keep putting up with the, the abuses of power that are going on. But it is a, an abuse of power, both in what they do and both in what they don't do. And um, it's, it's a criminal organization. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it. If you don't like it, you can complain to me about it. These are my opinions. They're not anybody else's. But we have a criminal organization running the country right now.
and they are avoiding the law wherever they can, evading and avoiding laws and just doing things the way they want to do it, any way they can figure out how to do it. Look at Portland right now uh, with uh, these secret police with unmarked uniforms <laughs> uh, going in and just picking people up. I'm sorry, this is, this is a serious situation and, and I cannot play nice and, and follow the rules and not advocate for anything. Uh, I have to call it what it is. I'm not telling you what to do about it, but I'm telling you that it is happening and that it is getting worse and it's going to get worse over time until we stop it. Period. Okay. I will move on. Uh, <clears throat> appropriately titled, our next article, A Matter of Life and Death, A Top Immigrant Advocate on the U.S. Election. Literally, A Matter of Life and Death. Maria Elena Inchaipe, the Executive Director of the National Immigration Law Center, or NILC, one of the nation's top immigrant advocacy groups, when things are going bad for Donald Trump, Im immigrant advocates like Maria Elena Hinchapie, okay, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's spelled H I N C A P I E, Hinchapie. Let me start over again. When things are going bad for Donald Trump, immigrant advocates like Maria Elena Hinchapie brace themselves for what could come next. A constant in this chaotic presidency is how immigration is used as a cudgel through rhetoric or policy when nothing else seems to be working out. Take this week. As national COVID-19 cases hit a record high and the president recovered from perhaps his worst attended rally, he visited the border wall, signed it, and suspended certain types of work visas. Every time that he's under attack or he feels he's been cornered, or may be blamed for something, we can expect that he's going to default to attacking immigrants, said Hinchape, the executive director of the National Immigration Law Center, or NILC, one of the nation's top immigrant advocacy groups. Hinchape continued, Our expectation is that over the next month, as the election gets closer, if the economy continues to be in this downward spiral, if we have another surge in the public health crisis because of the reopening, etc., that's what we'll continue to see. While bracing for the immediate future, Hinchape is also focused on what could happen in November. Hinchape has a key role in helping to shape the Democrat, Democratic Party's agenda in 2020 as a co-chair of the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force. In her position on the Task Force's immigrant, Immigration Committee, she has had a glimpse into what the future of immigration policy could look like should Trump lose the 2020 election. The task force includes lawmakers such as the New York representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the former Secretary of State John Kerry. It is a blend of progressives and moderates. And Chape comes at things from the Bernie Sanders wing of the party. It's been a lot of work, she said. We are three quarters of the way through and have been making some pretty substantial progress. Whoever wins in November will probably still be responding to an ongoing pandemic, a continuing economic crisis, and the effects of uprisings against the country's systemic racism. Chape, who moved to the U.S. from Colombia when she was three years old, 